Waalaikum salam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh This is RG from London, UK. What advice would you give to a woman married to a careless man in almost all the bars? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله على آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Question says, coming from the United Kingdom, what advice would you give a sister who's married to a careless man in almost all regards? First and foremost, the word careless is going to be relative and subjective from person to person. One person may be considered careless by an individual, and to another, they may consider that to have to be tawakkul, or not to stress, or not to have anxiety, or not to worry too much. It's nothing to worry about. This is what we need. Inshallah, we'll get it. So on and so forth, it'll be done. As an example, and the wife, she may say, but we need it. Do you understand? It's important. It's serious. You got a plan. I need it. Da 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 da. She's jumping back and forth, and he says, "I understand you. Inshallah, well, when you need it, I'll give it to you." She may say that that's careless, and he may say that she's over anxious, or she has a lack of trust in Allah, or whatever the case. So it's subjective. It's subjective. At the end of the day, if you consider your husband to be extremely careless in all regards. And if you feel like it's something that you can't live with and it's a fitna and it's going to lead you to ruin and destruction with regards to your worldly dunya and you don't want to be in that situation, Allah says, and if they split up, then Allah will give both of them from His bounty. Allah will give both of them from His bounty. Not your bounty, but His bounty. Allah could give him a better wife and he give you a better husband or equal or whatever the case may be. So if you can't live with the situation and it's difficult and you feel like it's going to bring ruin to you, listen to my words carefully. It's going to ruin your dunya. As far as if it's something that you can be patient upon, it's something that isn't that serious, that deep, or even if it is, but the deen clearly overwhelms those worldly shortcomings, be patient and remain in the situation. But just be careful and just be mindful. You may leave a man and you may say that he's careless in every regard, but he may have a kind heart. He may be a nice brother. He may marry another brother who's very responsible or he's very careful and he does the worldly things as you want them to be, but he may have a rotten heart or very poor dean. Huh? So you have to pick your poison in life. And everything is going to be of a certain level Perfection is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Perfection is for Allah Azza wa Jal. If you have a brother that's balanced, 60, 40, alhamdulillah, that's fine. 65, 35, deen, dunya, whatever, that's best. But just be mindful of this. Be what? Be mindful of this. If you have a good-hearted brother who's not a dhalim, he's not a tyrant, he's not an oppressor, he's not an evildoer, he's not a wicked sinner, he's not mean and evil to children and to pets and to stepchildren, he's a good-hearted brother, try to fix the situation. Try to work on the situation. Be patient. Because only Allah knows that it's a rarity in these days in 2018 to find a brother that has a good heart. Huh? Assalamu alaikum, kif halik, beard, phobe, this and that. And he's beating his wife up. Or he abuses kids or molests children. This is a reality that, we, that, that only people that deal with situations on a daily basis truly know. Being an imam of a masjid. Assalamu alaikum, kif halik, brother, oftentimes is a, a, a criminal, a tyrant. When he's not in front of the brothers and he's not around the people. So be mindful of that. That's my advice. Based off of my experiences of helping out and counseling people. And Allah knows best. I have a sickness where I am always wanting to prove that I am better and more pious than others. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan for the dua. And we make the same dua for you. And for all of the brothers and the sisters, the viewers, and the listeners. The best thing that I can tell you is to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to cleanse your heart and to cleanse your mind. And whenever you get those thoughts or those feelings or those whisperings, then immediately seek Allah's refuge. And stop. Don't entertain those thoughts. Do not allow them to fester and snowball in your mind and your heart. The moment it pops up, Audhu Billah, turn away. The moment it pops up, go and run. Pray to Allah. Make dua to Allah. And constantly beg Allah Azza wa to give you the tazkiyah. As the Prophet used to say in many a hadith, oh Allah give us purity. Oh Allah give us huda. Give us tuqa. Ah, give us richness and purity in these things and the prophetic supplications. Constantly be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever the whispering or the thought comes to you, immediately seek Allah's refuge and immediately turn away from it. Even if it keeps happening, don't entertain those thoughts. And know for sure that perfection and wanting to be perfect, sometimes it's a natural human feeling, a natural human mindset. It's natural sometimes. But to think that you're more pious and this and that and to be deceived and deluded, that's a sickness and illness that only Allah can remove from you. But as we mentioned in our workshop on the fiqh of fasting in Ramadan, we mentioned about spiritual hygiene. If you go back to the recording, me, Nafis, and the other brothers, it was four hours long. We spoke on spiritual hygiene. Before we even spoke on Ramadan and fasting and iftar and suhoor and how many rakats can you make? Do you raise your hands in the khunut? Before ruku, after ruku, before we got to any of those issues and technicalities, spot in the moon, we spoke about spiritual hygiene, which was a piece of advice or recommendation from Brother Khan with regards to Tazkiyat and Nufus. But we called it spiritual hygiene. The advice that was given or the suggestion that was made and me choosing to honor that advice and that suggestion and to put it before the fasting was done for wisdom. And that's because if you don't have spiritual hygiene, then oftentimes your fasting, your prayer, these things are no value. And if they're of value, it's going to be limited value. You have to have a clean spirit. It doesn't have to be 101% perfect, but a general washing and cleansing. Huh? Spiritual tazkiyah. And we mentioned in that lecture, that four-hour lecture, is that with regards to tazkiyah to nafs, it goes both sides. There's a side of the tazkiyah that is pertaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that only Allah can do. And at the same time, there's a side of that tazkiyah that the slave has to do. Beg Allah, cry to Allah, ask Allah, but you have to put in the necessary effort to humble yourself. You have to put in the necessary effort to avoid the sin, to avoid this, to seek knowledge, and so on and so forth. Huh? 
That's the best advice I can give you on this situation. And Allah knows best. Ali, Mansoor, Manchester, UK. Are demonstrations allowed in Islam? Question says, coming from Manchester, UK. Are demonstrations allowed in Islam? Yes and no. There are certain demonstrations which are allowed in Islam. Certain demonstrations which are obligatory in Islam. Mandatory to do. And there are other demonstrations which are disliked. And there are other demonstrations which are clear haram. Whether you mean by this word demonstration, what we call a protest or not. It depends. So the basic rule is this. Kitab and Sunnah, Allah says, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُوهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا Whatever you differ on, Allah says, whatever you differ over and dispute regarding, then take it back to Allah and His Apostle, if your belief is in Allah in the last day, because that's better. ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا And it will give you a more thorough determination. The affairs will be more thorough if you take it back to the Quran and take it back to the Sunnah. So Shaykh Rasulullah Ibn Taymiyyah Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he says that this verse in Surah 27 proves is that if the Muslims agree unanimously, if they have consensus, then it's the haq. It's the truth. As it's narrated from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, فَمَا رَآهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ حَسَنًا فَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ حَسَنًا He says, whatever the Muslims see is a good thing, then it is a good thing as a whole. Huh? And other narrations state, لا تجتمعوا أمتي على ضلالة My nation will never unite upon falsehood. And there are other proofs and evidences for ijma. The true ijma, when there actually is ijma, consensus. So this proves that if the Muslims agree, then it's the truth. But if they don't agree, if they disagree, then they take it back to Quran and Sunnah. And they take it back to the principles that are extracted and derived from Quran and Sunnah. Hmm? So therefore, demonstrations. What do the Quran and Sunnah tell us about demonstrations or about protests? Do we have an ayah or hadith that is sarih dilala right to the point, supporting or against demonstrations? If we do, then there's no opinion. Demonstrations are either obligatory, recommended, or they're haram. Kalas. We hear, we obey. And if we don't have those verses and those hadiths, then it's going to be open for investigation. It's going to be open for reason. It's going to be open for looking into the kitab and the sunnah and the generalities and the principles. One may say demonstrations are means of destruction of property. Clear. Destruction of property is unlawful in Islam. One may say demonstrations or protests is a means of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. That's obviously from Quran and sunnah. One may say demonstrations are means of men and women free mixing and women being molested and groped and raped when they demonstrate and protest in the street. Then that's going to be haram. One may say demonstrations are a means of people not monopolizing leadership and people not monopolizing power in the name of Islam. Obey the Muslim ruler. Listen to the Muslim ruler because it's in their favor. But when it comes to justice, when it comes to treating people equally when you're supposed to treat them equally, and treat them just and we're supposed to treat them justly. Loving the Muslims, hating the kuffar, and all those other things, you don't hear anything about them. Then that's clearly a game. So it's going to be based off of how you look into it. If you find the strangest things, Yanni, as we said this before and we'll say again, is that if something is hardcore proven from Quran and Sunnah, then it doesn't matter about the East and the West. But if something is based off of ijtihad, a scholar tries his best to figure out what's correct. And he's basing it off of his land, his country, the social, the cultural, the climate, the norm where he is. Then it isn't a requirement for Muslims who live in other locations. So you find a brother in America, the United States. Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward him for having the courage and the manhood to walk up to you face to face and give you advice. What a lad, Hamd. To walk up to you. Courage and manhood. I'm not here to introduce myself to you, Abu Sayyid. This is me, such and such. Listen, I want to give you advice. I'm not saying I know more than you, but I'm giving you advice and I feel that you made a mistake. That's what the brother said. And he said, with regards to protesting and things like this, I think that you made a mistake. I said, Jazakallah khairan. I don't agree with you. I feel your view is totally erroneous based off of proofs and evidences. 
And I feel like you're blindly following someone in a different time, a different place, in a different atmosphere. But I thank you for having enough manhood to say it to my face. Not like some brothers, they walk up to you, they give you a hug, they make the eye for you, and next one they talk about you. And they say, you didn't give me time, you didn't give me attention. You saw me in my face, you gave me a hug and a kiss. You said, keep up the good work, I'm proud of you, I heard so much good things about you. And you say, you didn't have time to give me advice? Is it me? Am I the crazy one, Abdul Kobe? So if you have a view about protesting and demonstrating, and you feel that it's correct, then that's fine. But know for sure there are others who have views about demonstrating and protesting, and they're basing it off of kitab and sunnah, and there's nothing that's clearly cut, then it's going to remain an issue of ijtihad. They say it's permissible to do demonstrations in Egypt, or permissible to do demonstrations in the United States. And they say that it's haram to do demonstrations in Saudi Arabia, a cardinal sin. Is there something concrete from Kitab and Sunnah? Or is it something based off of Ishtihad? Is it purely Ishtihad or are there political motives and social motives and someone saying that demonstrations are totally haram? It's the bottom line. If you choose to take a view of a scholar, a fatwa of a scholar, that's fine. There's no sin upon you for that. But do not force it upon the what? The next individual who says that I don't agree with that fatwa. Sure. Nor am I m obliged to agree with that fatwa. It's not obligatory to take every single fatwa from every single person. If that was the case, then we'd be no different than the Jews and the Christians. As Allah says, they took their rabbis and their pastors and their monks and their priests out of Baba and do they left. As lords besides Allah Azza wa Jal. So the point I'm trying to get to is is that any issue in Islam, any issue in Islam, if there's something which is concrete from Kitab and Sunnah, there's nothing to discuss, nothing to argue about. If it's something which is relative and subjective, and which is based off of personal investigation, then it remains as what? As that. And the layman Muslim who's following someone that he trusts and respects, that's what? That's fine. The student of knowledge, the one who studies and reads and researches, he is to follow his what? His own view. Whether Zaid, Bakr, Amr, John, Tom, Dick, and Harry like it or what? Or not. That's Islam. It doesn't get purer than that. Huh? So that's my view on demonstrations and protests. Some of them are clearly haram. Some of them aren't haram. It depends on the time. It depends on the place. It depends on what are you demonstrating for? What are you protesting for? Who are you speaking to? And most importantly, the political atmosphere. The political what? Atmosphere. The United States. A protest in the United States is not like a protest overseas. It's different politics, different political system, different culture, different society. Everybody understand this? And the lost Prophet Allah surely knows best. Last but not least, the ultimate stupidity of many people, they say that you can't have protests and demonstrations. And they say the proof is, is that you're re rebelling against the ruler. What Muslim ruler is there in the United States of America? Or the United Kingdom. Look how the extremism pushes a person's brain all the way into the corner. Demonstrations are haram in Saudi Arabia because one could possibly say, this ruler is a Muslim ruler, you're going against him, you're revolting, which is against the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fight! Munkin! In America, where's the Muslim ruler? Everybody understand this? So we ask Allah Azza to allow us to have the ability to use our heads. The reason why Allah gave us these brains is to do what? Use them, huh? And Allah knows best. That's my humble opinion on the issue. If those people who differ or feel differently, or feel that's wrong, there's nothing wrong with that, alhamdulillah. You're entitled to your own view, just like I'm what? Entitled to my own. And Allah knows best. This is J.I. from Lee in UK. Question says, coming from the UK, should the Salah al Ibrahimiyyah be made in the first of Shahud? First and foremost is when you send prayers upon the Prophet and also and also prayers upon Ibrahim wa Ali Ali Ibrahim. You have to understand that the scholars themselves they differ on the ruling on it. Is it obligatory to send prayers on a prophet in a prayer at all? In the salah at all, let alone first or second to show. 
is it even mandatory to send prayers upon a Prophet in the salah? That's an issue. Those who say that you do have to send prayers upon a Prophet when well, you can, then goes the fork in the road, first the shahud, and last the shahud, or only the last the shahud. But in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hopefully there's nothing wrong with making it in the first the shahud, as well as the, long, at the last the shahud. But in Allah, hopefully there's nothing wrong with that. Inshallah, that's in brief. And Allah knows best. Minnesota, would you make a video defending the integrity of the hadith regarding Misa return? <coughs> Question coming from Minnesota with regards to making a hadith about defending the integrity, or make a video, excuse me, make a video about defending the integrity of Isa ibn Maryam's return, huh? The second coming, huh? Abu Sayyid of Jesus. Tayyip, the return of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. The Nuzul of Isa and slain of the Dajjal. Bidnai Ta'ala, I will give this project to Brother Saleh, and it'll be his job to remind me to try to honor this request and give that information if we can give that information. Inshallah Ta'ala. Jazakallah Khairan for your input. Salam from Brooklyn, Salam Sheikh. It's permissible to wear Nike shoes since they take the name Nike from the gods. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The question coming from the lands of Brooklyn. Huh? Is it permissible to wear Nike shoes? Huh? Brooklyn. Tayyip? Is it permissible to wear Nike shoes? I'll say this humbly. If you say wear Nike shoes are haram because it's the name of a goddess, a goddess of speed or a goddess of victory, that's fine. But you can't drive a Mazda or a Nissan or Toyota, or Chevrolet, uh, all types of watches, all types of pieces of clothing, all types of foods and drinks as well. They have the names of goddesses and gods. Thursday is the day of Thor. Huh? The mighty Thor with the, the hammer, huh? Infinity Wars, right? Uh -huh. The guys act like you don't know who I'm talking about now. You don't know who Thor is? The mighty Thor. Thor is the day of Thursday. The Nordic god, the day in which they would worship, Thor, Thursday. Friday is the day of Frizz, Frizz Day, in which they would worship another god. Monday was the day in which they worshiped the moon, Moon's Day. So all of these different names and titles that come from shirk and polytheism, that also does what? Applies. It's haram to wear the sneakers. It's haram to call it this day. It's haram to pick up your paycheck on this day. And call it that, you go to your boss and say, Yo, Juma, I want my paycheck. Everybody clear on this? There are many things, different cars that you drive. You ever wonder, what is the, the symbol of Mazda, huh? All types of things, huh? That have haram, shirk, polytheistic origins and roots behind them. Huh? You like waffles, Abdul Qawi? You know, the original iron, uh, waffle iron was made with a crucifix to honor Christians. Don't take it from me. Read about it. You'll find it in the books. It's a historical fact. So one may say you can't have Belgian waffles now because they come from shirk. So there are certain things that you have to apply what? All around the board. Does Nike, with the check, the swoosh, huh? does it necessarily mean that it's the, the sign of the goddess or it's just the name? Or someone's name is Nikki? Or call someone's, a man's name Nick? These are all derivatives of this word. So that's my advice, is to be mindful, is to be careful, and to practice these things what? Across the board, with a moderate balance. If you don't feel comfortable wearing Nikes, you shouldn't wear them. Don't let your children wear them. But if you feel that there are many other things that have these types of names and symbols, that best. And the last thing I'm gonna say in this situation is, the last thing is what? As our entire modern society is based off of logo, the logo. And where do logos come from? Read about the origin of logos and how they are symbolic and what they mean and read about the people who came up with the concept of a logo. You'll be shocked what you'll find. And Allah knows best. Question come from Illinois. Praying without a sutra, does it affect the validity of the salah? 
No, it doesn't. Even though the correct view is that it is obligatory to pray with a sutra. As we have explained in the two-part lecture series, the fiqh of the sutra in the salah. We explained the issue in detail. Uh, and it doesn't mean that the prayer is invalid if you pray without a sutra. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Of course, there are issues that do pertain to someone breaking your prayer. Whether it's a donkey or a pubescent woman or anything like this. There are details with regards to someone coming between you and your sutra. And does that break the salah or not? But the general rule is that if you pray without a sutra and no one or nothing walks in front of you, it doesn't mean that your prayer is in veil, even though it's mandatory to pray with the sutra. Huh? The correct view, the view that we feel is correct. We explained that issue in detail. And Allah knows best. Please go back to that playlist. This is AY from West London. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Benefiting greatly. Is it permissible to study accounting? which requires practical work where I will be recording interest transactions as without working, you won't become qualified in the profession, let alone become chartered. And just to add, I can say, say in every accounting course that accounting is the language of business. Wa alaikum as rahmatullahi wa from West London. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to hear that you're benefiting. May Allah Azza wa allow you to benefit more. Please go back to Mufti Q&A in which we explained the ruling of a Muslim being educated and being trained and working in a bank. Please go back to that video. We gave some important detail with regards to Muslims being professionals and Muslims becoming certified and Muslims having their own and becoming independent and most importantly Islamifying the trade. But you cannot Islamify it until you go through the certification. You cannot become a licensed barber in which you have your own barber shop. No music, no half-naked shampoo girl, no gossip, no gambling, no selling of guns and drugs and pornos and this and that that goes on in the barber shop. You have an Islamic barber shop, but how can you have an Islamic barber shop if you're not certified? And how can you become a certified barber unless you learn how to shave someone's face? Unless you learn how to trim someone's eyebrows. Unless you learn how to do certain haram haircuts. So the bottom line is we live in America. We're not overseas. If we say that we want to have our own business, which is from the most important things that the Muslims must have today. Not the most important, but from the most important things. is for the Muslims to have some type of individual, independent source of income. In which they can pray, they can fast. We don't shake women's hand in this place. Any woman can come in here and buy something. How are you, ma'am or miss? But we don't shake hands. We don't do this. You cannot Islamify a thing unless you're certified. And oftentimes you have to go through certain haram hoops and loops to become certified. Please go back to that video. Be the next sponsor. Very, very important concept for us to keep in mind. Huh? With regards to living in these countries and making and having our own. Please go back to that video on Mufti Q&A. And Allah knows best. Coming from Birmingham, what are some of the businesses that the Sahaba had? Certain things are going to be parallel, and certain things are like night and day. We have to understand one thing, guys, and I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole, is that the companions, after the Hijrah, and they went to Medina, they never, ever lived as minorities. They were never the minority Muslims. Once there was hijrah and there was jihad, they were the majority. They were the dominant factors. They were the trendsetters. They were the policy makers through the pen or through the spear. The companions and the pious predecessors, and one may even say, one could possibly say, Allah alam, most of the Muslims for hundreds and hundreds of years, they never lived how we live today under the protection, care, safety of non-Muslims. So certain things that we have to do, places that we have to go, the companions, only Allah knows, they probably couldn't even imagine asking a Catholic to go and pray. They probably couldn't even imagine explaining and apologizing to a woman, I can't shake your hand. Some of the companions, they probably would tremble if they saw how the Muslims don't have wala and bara. 
and say that the Muslims, the Kafirs are our friends, they're our allies, we're with them, we love them, we support them, so on and so forth, we'll bomb a Muslim country with the help and the funding of non-Muslims. Some of them, they probably would, they probably say, these aren't Muslims. And this isn't an extreme statement. If you read some of the athar of the Sahab, Sahab and the Salaf, when they saw the people, they said, nothing remains except that you straighten the rules. That's the only thing that we can recognize of your Islam. Imagine this is the time of the Salaf, they said statements like this. So with this being said, the Sahaba, they sold things, they bought things, they traded, but the world was different then. Huh? Industrialization, globalization, all the commercial, these things are very, very different. But the general rule is the companions who sold things, who bought things, the companions who had craft, companions who did things with their hands, things like this, companions who farmed. Well, how could Huh? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد